to part four of our OCS tutorial series. Today we are going to be making a focus on supply and all its related functions, including zone of control, which has a significant impact on supply, and railroad repair, which I'll be covering in its own little special section. I'm going to be using some special demonstration units in both Tunisia and Smolensk for this video for the purposes of demonstrating every aspect of the supply system and everything that I wish to demonstrate. So a brief introduction, supply is one of if not the most integral parts of the OCS system. You're going to be running into it a lot and you're going to be running into it over the course of entire games each turn in multiple different phases and it has multiple levels multiple dimensions to it some of which interact with each other some of which do not so that being said let's get into it let's start with some reading and then we will do some board demonstrations with some of these units I've set up here. This is not part of a conventional setup. I've taken a little bit of a break from our usual Tunisia game to set up something temporary down south with some additional units made with displaying as many unique supply and zone of control situations as possible. So let's start with some reading. Supply, 12.0, chapter 12.0 in the manual. By the way, I have skipped quite a bit. I've skipped barrage, I've skipped combat, I have skipped reaction, I have skipped overrun. That will be covered in an upcoming video. Uh, combat and barrage are very specific actions undertaken over the course of your turn. I am trying to start by covering the more larger aspects that you'll be dealing with over the course of your play. So you can have those for consideration before you get into the nitty gritty details of barraging and combat. So there are two kinds of supply. On map supply represented by supply points and token counters and trace supply which is abstracted. On map supply is a type of non-combat unit primarily used to pay for artillery barrage, combat supply and fuel costs. Trace supply is used to determine whether combat units are in supply during their supply phase. Supply points can be used to provide trace supply when combat units do not have a valid supply line, but trace supply can never be substituted when supply points are needed. On-map supply, on supply is normally stockpiled in dumps set up behind the front lines. Units sometimes are close enough to draw supply directly from the dump, but more commonly supply is thrown to them by a HQ unit. Trace supply is notional. Combat units must trace a supply to a supply source, usually a port or map edge hex. As with on-map supply, HQs are typically used to put the front lines in trace supply. Rail connections and transport point extenders are often used to cover long distances back to a supply point, supply source. Important note, only combat units require supply. Non-combat units, air units, and naval units never consume supply point or need trace supply. Their supply needs are not explicitly modeled, except for air bases, which require refit supply. Cool. So that's just a brief overview of how the supply system works. And now we're going to look at the mechanical handling of supply. But before I do that, I want to give you a bit of an introduction to what we are looking at here. So here I've set up a few units. I've set up some American units with some supply on the southern half of the Tunisia map around Gafsa, there's some railway lines. There is an Axis HQ, but there is not an Allied HQ. There is some Axis supply. Uh, for the purposes of this tutorial, um, the railway lines leading down here from Feriana, they lead back to an American trace supply source. And also for the purposes of these tutorial, the railway lines leading down from the coast via Sfax up to Tunis are providing access trace supply. And you'll see exactly what I mean by that. 
but to be a bit more specific, these are going back to supply sources. Now supply sources are listed in the game specific rules, but I will be getting into how we trace that back. But if you remember from the Tunisia game specific rules, the western edges of the map are the trace supply, uh, the supply sources and bone for the allies. And for the Axis, it goes back to Tunis and Bizerte. I'm not going to scroll all the way back up there right now, but I will when we get into the trace supply covering. But for now, I'm going to cover mechanical handling of supply because we have a supply dump right here for us to work with. All right. Players can break down and add together supply points in the same hex by making change with supply point counters of equal value. Players can further break down supply points to tokens which are the small change of logistical currency. We spoke about this in video number two where we covered supply as a non-combat unit. One supply point equals four tokens or conversely one token equals a quarter of a supply point. I think we already know that. Combine tokens into supply points whenever possible to reduce stack clutter. Yeah, this is an important note. Don't deliberately keep everything in change of quarters and halves just to increase the size of a stack. That's a no-no. The abbreviation used for tokens is T, so the shorthand for two tokens is 2T. Note the graphic displayed on the supply points differs from that on tokens so that they are easy to tell apart. And the graphic on the token counter does not imply that tokens are only used for ammunition. Just to give you an example of what they are talking about. This is the token marker. All right, let's give this a fair bit more zoom. Zoom, 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 all the way in. Here we go. All right. So the graphic on the token count does not imply that these are only used for ammunition. Supply points and tokens are identical aside from their denomination. If you ever need any help understanding the different denominations, there is a diagram here in the manual that shows what two supply points is, which is just the supply points and two tokens and two tokens. The math is pretty simple here. It just takes a little bit of time to wrap your head around it. Right, there's some examples here for you can read in your own time if you wish. Uh, 2.1b supply dumps any location containing supply points I'm just going to delete this whether on the ground or loaded on a transport point is called a dump supply points do not have to be unloaded to be used All right. so just to give you an example I will bring in a truck uh, if I can have a truck here so here's a German truck I'm going to flip it to full All right so any location containing supply points, whether on the ground or loaded on a transport point, is called a dump. Supply points do not have to be unloaded to be used. So this is a dump, and this is technically a dump. And these supply points on the truck do not have to be unloaded to be used. But bear in mind, of course, as we covered before, organic trucks have restrictions where they can only units from that formation can use it. But yeah, you can use the supplies on these trucks if you can reach them. They do not need to be unloaded. Right. Supply dump markers. Some supply counters have letter designations instead of the usual numbers. A player can use these to represent supply dumps of any size. Just place the marker on the map and record its number of supply points on a scrap of paper. Aside from the paper record, these dumps are handled the same way as any other supply point in the game. Remove the marker if the dump is ever emptied. Right. I don't use these in Vassal, generally speaking, although sometimes I do, depending on what game I'm playing. Uh, but I do use them pretty much universally on the board. They are very, very helpful on the board when you have a pen and paper available. <sighs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Ownership of supply points. The generic supply point counters are common to both players, so it's important that players keep track of who owns what. A supply point belongs to and it can only be used by the player who brought it onto the map unless it's been captured. Now in Vassal this is going to be a little bit simpler because you're going to get like an X for the Axis and an A for the Allies, so it's a little bit easy to tell whose supply is what and you can change the size using right click. However, yes, when you're playing on the board, they're not going to have notation, so you need to be careful unless it's captured, and, and I will be getting into supply capture after this. Right. Transportation of supply. A player can move supply points using transport points in his air, naval, and rail assets. The capabilities and limitations of each are in the rules section governing each method, and there is a bunch of methods for moving supply some of which we've talked about already. We've talked about rail transport. We've talked about sea transport. We've talked about air transport. All can be used for transporting supply. But in this specific section, I'm going to focus back on transport points on the map um, so I can show you exactly how they work. Um, although I'm not sure if that's 
covered in this supply section or if this is covered in the specialized unit sections yeah so we'll 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 check out the uh transport points at the end of this video in the specialized unit section so back to the tutorial right leapfrogging very important rule a given supply point can be moved only by one type of transport air transport naval shipping rail cap transport points in a single phase and no supply point can be loaded if it was unloaded previously in the same phase it's really important to obey these rules you cannot leapfrog supply points around the map using different modes of transport or additional modes of transport you know once the supply point is unloaded it can't be loaded again all right once it's loaded it can be unloaded by the same transport but then it can't be loaded again right and once it's transported by truck it can't be transported by air sea or rail in the same phase it's important to emphasize phase here it's not actually saying turn so once you understand how the exploitation phase works in terms of organic trucks there is a little bit of wiggle room there but not much this rule is pretty much a solid um, now it is not a violation of the leapfrog rule of supply points is moved across the map and then used immediately that should go without saying right you just can't move it anymore on map supply right supply points are used in various phases for fuel movement supply combat refit aircraft supply internal ammo stocks pay for construction and as a substitute for needed trace supply important notes players use the same mechanics of direct draw and hq throw anytime they need supply trace fuel combat construction restocking internals aircraft refit fuel is never required to draw throw or trace supply which we'll get into soon um, and there are some exceptions for naval, but we'll get into that when we cover naval. So what, all it's, what it's basically saying here is that, there, yes, there is two different supply systems in this game, the on-map supply and trace supply, but for the purposes of actually distributing it and accessing it, they use the same system, which is drawing and throwing, and which we're going to get into right now. Direct draw. To draw supply, units must be within five movement points of a dump, or... A hex that is adjacent to the dump. Needed supply can be within draw, can be drawn from one or more dumps within range. Always use truck movement points when counting this path back to a dump. There is an exception to this for HQs of the throw range that is leg or track use that mobility type. There are no HQs of this type in Tunisia or Smolensk, um, but they are in other games, so keep this in mind when you see them. Count the movement points as if you're just moving a unit. All right. Now, this is pretty critical. Um, units have a draw range. Only some units need them. Combat units, uh, air bases, etc. Right? But for the units that do need them, this is what they have. Right? All the combat units that you see, you know, these guys, this HQ, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, they all have a draw range. This is what they're all going to fall back on in any scenario, what they can draw to. And it's five truck movement points, right? And in terms of truck movement points, it is, it is in fact referring to the terrain effects charts that we've looked at earlier, right? So these, this comes with many implications. The fact that, you know, your supply lines are being traced and drawn across the map in the worst possible movement point type, which is truck. So that is something you need to keep in mind. And I will give some actual demonstrations of how these work out on the board. <sighs> Excuse me. But we'll get to that in due time. The other form besides direct draw is throwing via a HQ. And now we've covered HQs as combat units in video two, but now here in video four, we're gonna be getting into their special one of their primary special functions, which is operating as part of your supply net. A HQ is able to draw supply from a dump and can then pass needed supply forward to the extent of its printed throw range. HQ's throw range in movement points appears on the counter. The color is used to indicate the throw range of mobility type. To throw supply, count a movement path using this throw range from the HQ to a unit needing supply or a hex adjacent to the unit. Count the movement points to uh, count the movement points to just as if moving a unit, right? Just the same as drawing, right? Just as if you're moving a unit, right? Truck movement points or whatever color is printed on the counter. You're going to find that most HQs are truck. There are exceptions to this, like with draw range, but they are not in Smolensk, Indonesia. So I won't be covering them in this video specifically. 
right? There is an example here of how this stuff works in the manual, but I'm not going to be using that. I'm going to be doing my own demonstration, right? Uh, a bit extra to this HQ thing. A, HQs can only throw supply that is used immediately. You can't move it like a truck would move it. You can't move it to a new dump. Right? You need transport to do that. HQ can only use supply that is immediately being used. Uh, HQs can throw to any number of friendly units, but specific games might impose restrictions. Right? There are some optional restrictions in Tunisia 2, but I'm not using them. That is for players to use when they feel more experienced. HQs in strap mode cannot throw supply. That's just a restriction of strap mode, which is what we discussed in the previous video. HQs cannot rethrow supply given to them by another HQ, but can use supply thrown to them for their own needs. So there is some specific provisions to this. So you can't daisy chain supply using HQs. You can't throw H throw supply to one HQ and then that HQ throws supply to other units or HQs. That includes for fuel purposes, just to keep that in mind, please. But if a if you have a HQ throwing to another HQ, that HQ can throw to that other HQ just for whatever that HQ personally needs to do, not in terms of its special functions, but if a H if one HQ just needs fuel for its own purposes or needs supply for combat or to eat off the map, one HQ can throw to another HQ, but not to extend any kind of special function. All right. Now, there is an adjacent is close enough rule, very important rule that we're going to be getting into over the course of the demonstrations, right? And it applies to all supply pathing, practically speaking. The adjacent to provision of supply paths is very important, regardless of terrain, even if prohibited. It is assumed that the unit will be able to get its hands on supply that can reach an adjacent hex. This applies to all types of supply handling that use direct draw or HQ throw, right? Now, you might not be able to visualize right now what that means or the implications of it, but I will be demonstrating it later. Right now, we're just reading through the rules. Right, supply path movement. Any kind of supply path is counted as if moving a non-combat unit through the hexes of the supply path. These paths can be traced through enemy non-combat units, ships, and planes, but never through a hex containing an enemy combat unit. All of the movement restrictions contained in section 6.1 apply when counting out supply paths. 6.1 governing movement. Right? An unnegated enemy zone of control blocks all kinds of supply paths in or out of a hex that are being traced to truck movement points. And we're going to get into how these zone of control stuff works soon. Note that some HQs and extenders use leg movement points and track movement points and the supply paths are unaffected by zones of control. Always use normal terrain costs, the summer slash clear variety. Now, some games like Tunisia do have um, t changes in terrain costs based on weather, but you always use normal terrain costs for supply paths and ignore all temporary bad conditions as a result of mud and snow, as well as the extra cost of moving through train busting. So, a few notes there, right? A unit can use movement costs that are temporarily reduced by weather. Right, yeah. So, any negative effects from weather do not apply to supply pathing. They do still affect unit movement, but any negative effects from weather do not affect supply pathing. So it's not like a snowstorm's going to come in, or the map's going to freeze, or mud's going to set in, and all of a sudden the supply pathing that you've been used to for a number of turns suddenly changes. No. So ignore negative weather effects when supply pathing, but you do not have to ignore positive weather effects. That is the exception listed here. Also train busting, which is something I'm going to get into when we look at air missions, is a mission that affects unit movement, but it does not affect supply pathing, right? Keep in mind that trucks moving supply is still unit movement, so it does affect that, but it doesn't affect supply pathing for the drawing and throwing supply, right? Holding boxes and supply. A unit in a holding box is representing a specific hex draw supply as if it is in the hex on the map. Since this unit is a holding box, only exists to give large stacks some elbow room. Yep, pretty self-explanatory. A unit in a holding box representing an off-map location draw supply from within that holding box, which usually has infinite supply dumps, as we've seen here in Tunisia. On-map units cannot draw supply from an off-map holding box. Pretty simple. Right. Now, combat supply. I haven't really covered combat in this series yet because it is very complicated and specific, but um, supply points, the ones of which you've been seeing over the course of the series so far, are used to pay for the cost of combat. 
Uh, direct draw, as we've described, and throwing fire HQ are used to receive and distribute combat supply. Units can use internal stocks only if on map supply is available. Now, internal stocks is something we're going to get into a little later, but we will display them in this specific video. Attacker cost is 1T per attacking step. There is an exception for one game called DAC. And defender cost is 2T per combat. Flat. But there is an exception if it's one regimental equivalent or less, the cost is 1T. Now, again, regimental equivalence here is, using, is being used to determine the cost of the amount of people in the hex paying for combat. It's not really related to losses in combat. That's where we get steps, but again, that's neither here nor there. Important note, units which do not have their full combat supply available cannot attack at all. Defenders always have the option to withhold combat, um, combat supply and defend at half strength. That's a particular nuance that I'm going to get into in our combat video, but for now, just keep in mind that there is supply costs to attack. I will be doing some simulated attacks in this video. I won't be looking at, like, I won't be actually running them. I'll just be doing it with assumed results, just to show the supply consequences of what happens when units move while attacking and get destroyed and, and territory is occupied and what are the supply consequences of those situations. But while I do those simulated attacks, I will show you the uh, payment of which, right? But uh, here we have fuel supply, another important use of supply points on the map, right? Direct draw and throwing via HQ are used to receive needed fuel supply. Combat units using truck movement points or track movement points cannot expend any movement points unless fuel costs are paid. Fuel costs must be paid to move even one hex, including the just one hex rule. Right, there is some naval exceptions to this. I'm not going to get into that right now. Fuel is never needed for other types of units and functions, such as leg units, trucks, specifically truck transport points, not truck movement point units, truck transport points, ships, aircraft, and supply drawing and throwing. Right? Combat units needing fuel to move do not need fuel to attack, defend, barrage, retreat, or advance after combat. So generally speaking, what happens in combat stays in combat. There isn't really a fuel impact for the results of combat. However, an overrun where you move in combat does require the attacker to pay for fuel, even if you're starting adjacent. So you can't overrun if you can't pay for fuel. All right? Now, there are a few different methods for paying for fuel. Three, to be exact. All right? And why, why would there be three methods for paying for fuel, you ask? Why wouldn't there just be one simple linear fuel payment method? And the answer is fuel economy, right? Since fuel consumes supply, you want to be able to be given the option to make decisions that allow you to conserve that supply and move more units at a cheaper price, which is just another feature of the supply system in this game. So that being said, Let's take a look at what these different methods are, right? And I will try to give some demonstrations. So the first is the formation method, all right? By the way, according to the cases below, pay fuel costs in any phase the unit incurs them in the instant they are incurred, right? Formation method. Pay one supply point to fuel a multi-unit formation. This fuel lasts until the next friendly cleanup phase. To mark this, flip the formation marker onto its fuel side. If all units of the formation needing fuel are not using the same HQ for fuel thrower or using the same dump for direct draw, apply the single unit method below to fuel units that cannot draw from a common source. Right? So ideally you're going to be wanting to do this for a multi-unit formation that can all get it from the same source, otherwise it's not going to work out very well. Right? So for example, I have a multi-unit formation here. And I could fuel them up using the formation method and that would flip their marker to this side with the fueled side up, right? I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just showing that for demonstration purposes, but it would cost one supply point. There is another method called the HQ method. Pay one supply point to fuel a HQ, HQ itself plus all independent units within its throw range. This, again, fuel lasts until the next cleanup phase. Mark this off by placing a fuel marker on top of the HQ. So I could, for example, spend one supply point and then I could put a fuel marker on top of this, right? To indicate that this HQ has now just done a HQ fueling. So anyone within its 10 truck movement point fuel range is now fueled. 
if they are an independent unit. Now, if you go back to video number two, we were having a bit of a discussion about the differences between independent units and uh, other units. Multi-step formations are not independent units. They are multi-step formations. They are not under the definition of an independent unit. An independent unit is everything except a multi-step formation and a multi unit formation as well. This is a multi-unit formation, right? Multi-step formations are not in this, but they are in Smolensk. Remember, they're the ones with the uh, step marker, the yellow circle, right? Neither of those are independent units and they require their own fueling, either by the single unit method, which we'll get into in a moment, or the formation method if they're a multi-unit formation, right? So this HQ method only fuels independent units, of which you may have many. In this example, I don't really have any but you may have many. Um, I'll just put some on the board as an example. Uh, well, that's not, that's not a fuelable unit, right? But this is, and uh, this is, right? And, um, you, you know, this is, right? And uh, this is as well. So, before I explain the implications of this HQ method, let me explain the single unit method first, right? Single unit method. Pay one T per unit that needs fuel. This method can be used by any unit regardless of size or steps, whether it is independent, multi-step, or part of a formation. This fuel only lasts for the current phase as opposed to step A and B. There is usually no reason to mark this type of fuel. Right? Now let's just talk about the implications of all these different options. A, the formation method is good in certain scenarios. These scenarios usually are when you plan to execute multiple movements. Now, without, I haven't really gotten into something called the exploitation phase yet, but like I said when I was talking about movement, yes, most of your movement does occur in the movement phase, but there is movement that also occurs after the movement phase, in the exploitation phase, with units that you mark and reserve. So there is particular situational benefits to fueling units over the course of the entire turn, right? Up until your next cleanup phase, which is how the formation method and the HQ method work, right? And in many cases, multi-unit formations like the ones you'll see in Tunisia are made up of up to eight or nine or, I don't know, like 10 different units. And if you look at the single unit method, that would cost 10 tokens, aka two and a half supply points to fuel if you're doing the single unit method, which is wasteful. You want fuel economy, so you're going to use the formation method. Pay one supply point instead of paying over double, if that makes sense. That's where the fuel economy aspect of this comes in. The same with independent units, right? If you take a look here, I've got five independent units. One, two, three, four, five, including the HQ. If I wanted to move all five of these, I could spend five tokens via the single unit method, which is, again, the default simplest way of paying for fuel. And it would only fuel them for this movement phase. Or I could use the HQ method, which will fuel up not only the HQ, but also all these four units and any other independent units in the throw range of the HQ for the entire turn, all the way up to the cleanup phase. So then they'll remain fueled if they get any other opportunities to move throughout the duration of my turn, right? So that's just a brief look into the nuance of why I might want to use those different fueling methods, right? Moving on. The phasing player must remove fuel markers from his HQs and flip his formation markers to their non-fueled side during his cleanup phase. This sequence means that fuel markers placed during the reaction phase when releasing reserves give the best possible miles per gallon. Yes, that's true. I'm not going to give an exact demonstration of this right now, but it is true that if you fuel up a multi-unit formation in your reaction, which is part of the enemy player's turn, because there's no cleanup for you in the enemy player's turn, that fuel lasts all the way through the enemy player's turn, up until your turn, through your movement phase, all the way through your turn, past your movement phase, to your exploitation phase, all the way up until your cleanup. What this potentially means is that you can release a unit in reserve in the enemy's turn, move it 50% of its movement allowance, then get to your turn into the movement phase, put it into reserve, move it another 25% as per we saw in the previous video, you can move 25% in your movement allowance. And then in a video that I will show in the future in the exploitation, you can move it an additional 100% of its movement allowance. 
So throughout that entire process, for the cost of one fuel payment, however much that may be, you, you know, one supply point for a formation, right? You can move 175% of its total movement range. Now that's, you, the, the amount of situations where you're gonna wanna do that are not expansive, but it's just an example of what they're saying right here is that um, you get the best miles per gallon, right? And miles per gallon is a part of OCS. You know, when you're paying these supply points, you don't wanna be wasting them on movements that aren't going very far, and using methods that aren't giving you the cheapest price for your fuel, right? The nuance of this is really something that I can only demonstrate once we get into series of videos looking at actual gameplay of players versus players, which are coming up soon. So I'll, we'll be able to give you some better examples of that then. But for now, it's most important is that you just understand these three distinct methods of fueling units. And as you play the game, you will begin to understand their nuances and specific applications. Right? Moving on. A HQ can fuel all independent units as defined by 3.2F, which we talked about before, in its throw range for free, avoiding the single unit methods 1T per unit phase once the cost has been paid in B. The throw range is counted when each independent unit begins to move. Right, So you can't move an independent unit well, I mean, it's there's not many situations where you can contravene this, but yeah, basically the unit needs to be within range of the HQ to receive that fueling. A fueled HQ is only allowed to throw fuel from a single location each phase. This affects a moving HQ, which must choose whether to throw fuel from its starting hex or ending hex. Now, as I understand it, you can, for example, do a fueling, right? And you need to decide, okay, I'm doing it from this starting hex, right? Um, but then you can then, before you start moving, change modes and start moving on, right? You can just keep the fuel marker here and perhaps even write 10 truck MP to show that this is where the HQ fueling came from, right? Just as an example. Perhaps a honcho can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that is what I've always known and believed in regards to this particular rule. The placement of reinforcements does not need fuel, but moving beyond entry hexes requires a payment of fuel costs, if any. Reinforcements do not get free fuel the turn of arrival. Keep that in mind when you're dealing with your reinforcements. Internal stocks cannot be used for fuel costs. Keep that in mind. The only way you're paying for fuel is supply points on the map. If there aren't any, you're not getting your fuel. There has to be some kind of source. All right. There is a large example here that you can read in your own time but I'm going to be moving on to trace supply now, right? Everything that you've just heard is uh, how physical map, how physical supply points on the map are used for combat and fuel supply. They have other applications in construction, in feeding units that might be surrounded, etc., etc. but those are one of the fuel and combat are two of the most primary applications that you're going to be using for. But now let's get into trace supply. Now, before I start reading the actual rules of trace supply, I can give a bit more of an abstract explanation of what it is. Um, there are many different ways to describe it, but fundamentally what it is, is it's the blood that keeps your units breathing and alive, pumping through the veins, oxygen in the lungs. That's a very abstract description. Perhaps a more accurate one might be, it's the food in their stomachs. It is a telephone line or otherwise that connects them back to their larger headquarters, their larger command network, right? Cut by moving too far from lines of communication or being cut off by the enemy interrupting those lines of communication. That's a very abstract explanation. A more apt direct explanation might be these are lines on the map that you trace back to an origin point um, that validate whether your unit is okay to be uh, basically whether your unit is in danger or not and if it's in danger it could die based on a dice roll that's the most simplest explanation but let's just get into what the rules say combat units to check for trace for, supp for supply during their supply phase now where is the supply phase we were just covering aircraft reinforcement movement excluding barrages in the previous video so now we are looking at the supply phase right so it's important to remember that these things such as trace supply checks only occur in the supply phase. They are not instantaneous, 
right? So combat units need to check for trace supply during their supply phase. If unable to obtain trace supply or eat off the map, combat units are marked out of supply and must check for attrition. In addition, units can use breakout if unable to make their trace during the breakout segment, and we'll get a little bit more into how that works later. Direct draw and throwing via HQ are used to receive and distribute trace supply, just like all other supply pathing like we were talking about before. There are three kinds of trace supply, sources. Map edge railroad hexes that allow reinforcement entry, plus other supply sources mentioned in the game specific rules. So in the case of Tunisia, right, I, I have the ongoing game going up here, right? But in the case of Tunisia, as detailed in the rules, this is the A line and Bon. So we're talking about these as an origin point, right? Detrainable hexes, which we described when we were talking about rail transport. Again, these are just railway stations at the yellow dots and villages and cities along a connected railway line, right? And they have to go back to a, you know, reinforcement entry or supply source hex, such as once again, Bone or A in the case of the Allies, or uh, Tunis and Bizerte in the case of the Axis, although the Axis does not have rail transport, the rail network for the Axis only exists for trace supply in Tunisia 2. And hexes with an extender that connect to a detrainable hex or directly to a supply source. And we're going to look at uh, Smolensk to give that a better explanation after this. Uh, an enemy zone of control in any type of supply source hex prevents trace supply from being obtained, but these can be negated per 4.5b. As we start looking at a demonstration of how this stuff works, we're going to talk about zone of control. Right. Eating off the map, combat units that cannot make their trace to supply source can eat supply points to obtain trace supply. For every 1T spent, up to two regimental equivalents within draw range or throw range of the dump can be fed. Round all fractions up. For example, six and a half regimental equivalents will cost four tokens. Units can only eat off the map if no trace supply is available. All right. Now, there's a few other rules governing this, but combat units that can neither make their trace or eat off the map are marked out of supply and roll for attrition, and we will take a look at that in a demonstration. All right? Units, and there's a play note here, remember that units are never forced to eat off the map, and basically what's that saying is sometimes it might be tactically advantageous to let your own troops starve. All right? Strat mode units are not allowed to eat off the map and must end their movement in supply points in, in, in hexes where trace supply is currently possible. HQ and strat mode cannot throw supplies. We've heard that a few times now. So what this basically means is when you're putting units in uh, strat mode, they can't move off the supply net at any given point in time. They have to be at some point being able to be thrown uh, or draw trace supply wherever they are right? when they're using strat mode. So uh, all combat units in a multi-unit formation should make their trace to the same HQ or same direct draw source. If this is not possible, then select part of the formation that traces for free, while the rest must be out of supply. Yes, so this is a very specific rule, but an important one gov gov governing multi-unit formation specifically. And it's a rule that essentially is there to motivate or force, one might say, players to keep their multi-unit formations roughly together in the same geographic space or connected to the same HQ. Because again, what this rule basically means is that if your multi-unit formation cannot get trace supply from the same source, either by drawing to it or being thrown by the same HQ, then effectively one side or another or multiple sides of that multi-unit formation, depending on where they are geographically, are out of supply and have to eat off the map or roll for attrition. Um, it's not exactly a rule based in reality, but it is an important rule that's there to make sure that multi-unit formations don't go breaking their lines of communication within their own division and sitting on opposite sides of the map to each other, basically. Right? It will put strain on your supply network if you do that. Ground units in a landing craft are always considered a trace supply. Yeah, we're not going to get into that. That's naval. Units planning to make an airdrop do not require trace supply on the turn they're dropped. Yeah, that, that governs airdrops, which we will be covering in a later video. So much stuff to cover in later videos. But again, I just don't want to get detracted um, into things that aren't relevant to what we're covering. And then we have extenders. And I'm not going to cover extenders yet. I will be doing it in this video, but not yet. Um, I And then obviously we've got attrition and out of supply and internal stocks. 
Uh, I will be covering this in this video, capturing dumps, destruction and capture, transport points, but I want to take a stop now to start doing some actual demonstrations of the things that we are talking about. But before I can do that, we need to talk a little bit about zone of control, which has its own little short section. Because it's a, on paper, it's not a very complicated topic, but in practice, it, it has such a wide range of effects across the course of a game that you're going to find that it comes up many different times. So, what is zone of control? Attack capable units in combat mode have a zone of control unless currently marked out of supply. And again, getting marked out of supply relates to not having trace supply in the supplies phase. We just discussed that. Units in other modes do not have a zone of control. Keep that in mind. There is an exception to this. Exploitation marked units that are still in combat mode do have a zone of control because exploitation mode is not a penalty. It doesn't remove anything like a zone of control. But we'll get into that when we look a bit closer at exploitation phase. A unit's ZOC limits enemy actions in the six hexes adjacent to the unit. This is true regardless of the terrain in those hexes and the hex sides between them. So it's kind of like a force field, one might think, in the six hexes surrounding a unit. So let's uh, let's zoom in on this uh, first armored unit over here in Gafsa. And let's just put some hexes down, right? Or let's put some KTX markers down. Because this is an attack-capable unit. Its combat unit, its combat strength is not parenthesized. And it is in combat mode. In case you couldn't see that, right? It's in combat mode, so it is displaying a uh, zone of control, and in all six adjacent hexes, where I've got KTX markers here, just as an example, right? Now, what does it do? What does this zone of control do now that it's being displayed here, right? The following actions cannot be taken in an enemy zone of control. An action marked negation, however, is allowed if the zone of control is being negated, 4.5b. A negation is not possible for the others. Truck movement, A, can be negated. A unit with truck movement points, and, you know, mobility types have been explained in 3.1a, we've already covered that in previous videos, that enters an enemy zone of control, must either end its movement or conduct an overrun. One overrun might lead to another, thus allowing the unit to continue through more than one zone of control. Note that units starting the phase in enemy zone of control can exit or enter that hex using truck movement points, and that movement using leg, leg or track movement points is unaffected by zone of control. Right. And as you'll see in part B, this affects supply as well, but yeah. Units that move on a truck movement point, right, and that does include these units of the 9999 Light German Infantry Division, right see in their movement mode they move with truck right um, a unit with truck movement points that enters an enemy zone of control must either end its movement or conduct an overrun right so if he goes here he has to stop or overrun but he can't overrun here because the cost is too great I'll get into that in an overrun series video right but let's just say that we wanted to flank around this unit we can't not with this guy, because he has to stop here. There's a zone of control. There is, a, by the way, a diagram that will give a better explanation of this in the manual itself, if you want to check that out, but I'm just giving my own demonstration, right? Let's move him back, right? So, but it can be negated, and we're going to talk a little bit about negation soon, because I, I do want to try to flank this unit, and I'm going to show you how. But just in the same vein as number A, we have B, Supply lines, also negatable. An enemy zone of control blocks all kinds of supply paths traced with truck movement points in or out of a hex. Note that a HQ and extender with leg or track mobility is unaffected by zone of control, right? So truck movement points, again, most supply lines that you're going to run into are traced with truck movement points. There are some exceptions to this, like wagon extenders, you know, or leg movement point HQs. They exist, but for the most part, you're dealing with truck movement points in your supply lines. And so what that means is that an enemy zone of control is capable of cutting those supply lines. They don't even have to sit directly on your supply line to cut it. They only need to put a zone of control on it to cut it. And the implications of this are far reaching, but... Uh, yeah, it's it's something that you're only really going to be able to see over continued play. But anyhow, it is negatable, and we'll talk about that soon. 
Literal rail transport, as in transporting units and supply and such via railways, is blocked by zone of control and this cannot be negated. So even if you've got a unit there protecting the hex, it's unnegatable. Uh, transport for trace supply can be blocked by zone of control, but that can be negated. Uh, rail conversion is blocked by zone of control. Port operations. Um, yep, that is also blocked for trace supply, can be negated. There is an exception for DAC. Keep that in mind if you're playing DAC. Port operations, literal using CCAP, is blocked by zone of control. So already we're starting to see the significant implications of this. Just having a com attack capable combat unit in combat mode adjacent to many of these things shuts it down, and in many cases you can't even do anything about it because negation is not possible. Aircraft refit, you can negate that. Reserve mode, you can't enter reserve mode in an enemy zone of control. But uh, if you are in, already in reserve mode, you can enter and exit a zone of control normally. Strat mode, units cannot change it to strat mode in an enemy zone of control, nor can they ever enter zone of control and in a, uh, nor can they ever enter a zone of control while in strat mode. Right? So um zone of control. Yeah, so basically stay away from zones of control in strat mode. And you can't do replacement rebuilds while in a zone of control. Another thing to keep in mind. Right? So here we have a long list extending across multiple different sections of the rulebook of what zone of control impacts. And there is, you know, there is a lot to that. And it, it impacts things that aren't listed here, including retreats. But that's something that comes up when we're going to start talking about combat. Right. But uh, there is negate, negation is possible. Right. So how do you negate a zone of control? Per 4.5a, some ZOC effects can be negated. An enemy ZOC in a hex is negated if that hex contains a friendly combat unit that... that uh, that moment and further the unit doing the negating will not spend movement points later in the current phase it is allowed to leave the hex via actions such as advance after combat or breakout which do not require expenditure of movement points the friendly combat unit during the negation uh, does not need to have a zone of control itself note that when a unit starts the phase in an enemy zone of control negation is not needed to exit that hex so this is pretty self-explanatory a unit in a zone of control is negating it However, there is a addendum to this. It's only being negated if the unit will not spend moving points later in the current phase. What that essentially means is that a unit negating a zone of control is locked there. Um, not it, like if you use that negation, if you take advantage of that negation in any way to get a unit past it, then it's locked there. What this is most relevant to is when you are negating zone of control, for example, to retreat, a unit that is doing the negation and blanketing that path can no longer move any further. But I'm not doing any retreats here, so I can't really demonstrate that, but I am going to do some advances through some zones of control. And when you when you cover a zone of control so that your friendly forces can move past it, we tend to call that blanketing. And I'm going to give you an example of that now. Right? So I'm just going to delete these markers because I think you've been given a pretty good idea that there is a zone of control around this combat unit but I want to I want to capture this hex and I'm going to explain why I want to capture this hex a bit later but because there's an enemy zone of control here I need to negate it so I'm going to go take this artillery unit right now remember a unit doesn't need to have a zone of control of itself right friendly combat unit doesn't have to be attack capable right this is a friendly combat unit. I'm going to put him here using his leg movement allowance. And that negates it, so now I can change the mode of one of these units into its movement mode, which is truck movement points. I can fuel it up, which I will do. Right? I haven't shown you the exact way to fuel units before, but again, it's pretty simple. In this case, a HQ, like we've talked about, is going to use its draw range. HQs have draw ranges too. He's going to draw back to this dump within five truck movement points. One, two, three and a half. That's well within. And he's going to pull from this dump, which I'm going to break down into change with the physical handling component that we discussed before. And I'm going to take one T by reducing this down to three T. So one T is now being consumed to pay for the fuel of this unit. Right? How does it do it? Well, this HQ is using its throw range, so it's drawed. And now it's going to throw within 10 truck movement points from this hex. One, two, 
three, four, five. So it just uses throw range. So like a baseball player, it, it, it draws back to pick up a ball within five truck movement points and adjacent, and then throws it within 10, which is the printed number here, and adjacent. Remember the adjacent is good enough, and I will have examples of that later. So now this unit is fueled. That's how the fuel system works in this game, right? If there was no HQ, keep this in mind, if there was no HQ, there would be no fueling. If there was no HQ here, this unit would have to draw. One, two, three, four, five. Even adjacent to that, there's no supply available. So he would not be able to get fuel supply. So in this case, the HQ is critical to this unit's fuel supply. So now that the uh, zone of control here is negated, he can move here without having to stop because the zone of control being emitted there is now negated. He can move here, there's no zone of control. He can move here, there's no zone of control. And he can move here, and he can move here, and he can move here to capture that. Right. So that would have cost one, two, three, four, five, six truck movement points. Now remember, as he's going from here to here to here, he's using this road going through the rough, so he doesn't have to pay the cost of the rough. And he's now captured this town called Metalawi. Metalawi, however you pronounce that. I'm not, I'm not North African myself. Right. So I've just conducted a move, and I've paid for it, and I've just given an explanation of how drawing and throwing works in the context of providing some fuel supply, right? But I've also done something else here, and I want to explain that in the context of trace supply, because now that we've talked about trace supply, and we've also talked about zone of control, I, um, I want to show you the implications of that. So we've spoken about trace supply, and we've spoken about how it's provided. Um, so I want to show you this situation from the perspective of the allied player. Right? Um, so remember that trace supply comes along from the railway lines and the detrainable hexes along a railway line, remember for a hex to be detrainable, it has to go back to a supply source hex. And you know, I could scroll up and show you, but just take my word for it. This railway line from Feriana going northward is connecting itself up to a allied supply source hex. Right? However, this railway line does not go straight down this road to Gafsa. No, sir. Right? It goes around to Gafsa and then supplies these units over here. However, there's an additional layer to this. The Germans have a combat unit here emitting a zone of control, which cuts the trace supply here. Which means that these two American units are out of trace supply. Now this has no... If, for the sake of argument, this is the Axis movement phase, this has no immediate implications. You know, cutting of supply does not immediately do anything, right? But, let's just say that the Axis turn is concluded, we move into the Allied turn, and now it's the Allied movement phase, right? And I'm the Allied player, and I can see, oh damn, right? These units have been cut off from trace supply, any supply for that matter, right? What can I do? Well, there's a number of options available here, right? There are quite a number of options available. And to discuss those options, we're going to have to move into another section of the manual. So we're going to go back to do some manual reading now. And we're going to talk about attrition and out of supply, right? So I will get back to extenders after we finish this demonstration in Tunisia. In the supply phase, so let's just say that um, we're not in the supply phase yet, but... In the supply phase, a friendly stack that cannot make its trace or eat off the map is marked out of supply and checked for attrition. The marker remains until the trace supply is regained in a subsequent friendly supply phase. Units marked out of supply check for attrition at the end of each friendly supply phase until back in supply. Check for stack for attrition by rolling on the attrition table. 
the two dice using the column for the highest action rating among the units marked out of supply, and counting only the steps in the hex that are out of supply, the table result is the number of stacks that must lose. The owning player chooses how to inflict those losses on the out of supply in the stack. There are no requirements to take these losses from the unit with the highest AR. Right. Now we're going to get a little bit into that as we look at the uh, out of supply rolls in a moment, but for now we're just going to continue reading. When checking for attrition, do not adjust the unit's AR for being DG mode, but do adjust for strap mode. This should never come up given 12.6e. Right. So you really shouldn't have any strap mode units being marked out of supply, but it can happen because they get cut off, right? and that's pretty disastrous. Out of supply effects. I just want to note that out of supply is not a mode. It is a status. So modes and everything that we talked about in the previous video, they are one thing, but out of supply is something that can happen on top of all those modes. Right? It is a status, not a mode. Right? Units marked out of supply have no zone of control, for starters. If combat supply is available, such units attack and defend at half strength. Without combat supply, out of supply units cannot attack or defend at quarter strength. Given barrage supply, out of supply units can barrage normally. Units marked out of supply can move normally. Right? So it has its own specific effects, but it works in tandem with various modes that you might be dealing with, including reserve or DG or anything else like that. Right? Breakout. During their breakout segment, any combat units, not, not, not non-combat units, that are currently out of trace supply, make a trace check during the segment, and have a printed movement allowance of at least one, can attempt to break out if they meet the following conditions. Right? So let's just say for the sake of argument, these unit, we're in our movement phase, and we're at the breakout segment of the movement phase, and these units are definitely cut from trace supply, right? They're cut from here and they're cut from here, there are multiple cuts to their trace supply. All right, how does this work? There must be a path of any length from a friendly unit to a friendly unit in trace supply. That path must be free of enemy combat units and terrain that is prohibited for movement, using the unit's movement allowance in its movement mode. Right? This path for a truck movement points must also be free of enemy zone of control. So that's condition number one to break out. The unit must be at or within 15 hexes of a friendly combat unit in trace supply. Straight line, ignore our enemy units in zone of control. All right. So these units actually do fulfill that. Yeah, right. Um, any length, they can just go around here and come back down here and they're fine. They can connect to this guy who is in trace supply. Why is he in trace supply? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4... 4.5 to Feriana, which is a detrainable hex connecting to a trace supply source. So this guy in Gafsa, he's fine, even though the, the supply path, no, path, works, path networks to his uh, east and west have been cut, he's fine. So for these A and B definitions, these units over here, they do meet that. However, it's important to note that on the first turn a unit finds itself out of trace supply, not after it eats off the map or uses a special form of trace supply, such as supply cache or tree bark soup, which are in specific games. The above conditions are waived, right? So just forget about that for the first turn. They're out of trace supply. And you get a one plus DRM dice roll modifier. You know, you get one plus to your dice roll chances um, to escape. And transport points are eligible to break out. You have to roll for each point separately. Breakout is always voluntary. Roll for each unit attempting breakout. One to four, it fails. It's placed in the dead pile. 5 to 6, the unit succeeds, it's removed from the map, but will return to play as a reinforcement. Roll again for each successful unit, it returns that number of turns in the future. Returning unit retains any step loss marker, but loses all other markers, low ammo, DG, etc. Right, and you can use the turn record track as a reminder for when units return. So, I'm going to display both scenarios of what happens if you break out or if you go out of supply. So let's start with the breakout scenario, right? These guys are out of trace supply and I, for whatever reason, I want to break them out. It's the first turn, I don't need to look at these conditions, but remember, if it's not the first turn, you need to look at these conditions. But even if it wasn't the first turn, they do meet these conditions, so I can break them out, right? But because it's the first turn, I get a plus one DRM, 
which means I succeed on a four to six, not a five to six, right? And I fail on a one to three, not a one to four, right? So you roll for each unit and then you roll to see if it succeeds, how many turns in the future it comes back as a reinforcement, right? And usually something like the Tunisia two rules will tell you where breakouts come back to if you take a look at the specific rules for each side. So let's start with this guy, right? I'm gonna take a one dice roll and I roll a six. That means he successfully breaks out, right? But he's temporarily dead, as in off the map. I'm going to roll one dice to see how many turns he comes back in the future. Six. So what you would do here is you bring up the turn weather. You could go to the top of the map, or you could just bring up the uh, the uh, little dialogue that you can pull up here by pressing up there. And you count six turns. You go one, two, three, four, five, six right so on the 5th of december it's currently the 15th of november this is not an accurate portrayal of what you might be looking at in the game it's just for the sake of demonstration so on the 5th of december this unit will come back as a reinforcement right to represent that it's finally reconstituted itself out of breaking out right and for example this unit to the right if i was to roll a three um it's still a failure right i've rolled a three it fails to break out, which means it just goes to the dead pile. It's now dead and can be rebuilt at a later time. Now let's undo all that. And let's talk about what happens if I get to the supply phase and it is now out of supply. Like it says, you need to check for attrition. All right. So first of all, let's go to fuel and supply and mark these guys OOS out of supply. All right. There you go, they're now out of supply, which means in the supply phase, as per the turn summary, they need to check for attrition on all stacks. Now keep in mind that you're rolling for attrition per stack, not per unit, right? And there are some there is some nuance to that. But let's bring up our 4.3 charts, right? It's gonna be a little bit small and difficult for you to see. Um, so I think I might just go bring them up in a much bigger, screen so that you can see what I'm talking about. 4.3 charts and tables, attrition table, here we go. Right, here's the attrition table. Right, use the use the column of the best AR in the stack that is out of supply. Right, and there's a dice roll modifier of plus three if there are more than five steps in the hex. A higher roll in this case is worse, you want a low roll, right? So let's start with this guy on the right. You know, it's not a stack, it's one unit, but if they were stacked together, they would operate together, right? And on this guy, we've got a three action rating, right? And you roll two dice, right? 12.8B, roll two dice. A 10. A 10 means lose four steps. I only have one step to lose here, but one way or the other, he's dead, right? Chances were not very good there to begin with. Next guy, two action rating. I need to roll a 1-1 one, one or a 1-2 at the very most to, to have him live here. Because he's a two action rating, it's quite low. His chances of survival are not great. So I roll two dice. It's a six, which is two steps. He's dead. This is what happens when units get cut off and out of supply. This has nothing to do with combat. These guys didn't get fought in combat. The combat system was not involved here. These guys died because they were cut off from supply and they were not broken out. That's what happens in the supply phase when guys run out of supply. But um, I'm going to put them back because there are more demonstrations to be made. And I'm going to say, let's say for the sake of argument, that uh, uh, let's see. Let's say for the sake of argument, um, two tokens of supply were supply dropped to them by an aircraft. You know, there comes the aircraft, and in the Allied movement phase, he uses that to pay for these guys to go and put themselves back into trace supply. They've both fueled themselves, and now they're gonna transport themselves back into trace supply. So let's see. Right. So one of they will both go one, two, three, four, five, six. And this guy will go one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm gonna keep him in their combat mode. 
Don't ask me why. It's probably not the best tactical decision, but I'm doing it so that there can be some consequences that I can explain to you, right? Now, let's just say for the sake of argument, this is what the Allied player did in his movement phase. What is his new supply situation? Well, this guy can still get trace supply. One, two, three, four. There's the nearest detrainable hex, right? He's good. This guy, one, two, three, four, five. Yes, he gets it. Remember, there is an adjacent is good enough rule. So he's adjacent to this supply source. He's good. And he is blocking this zone of control. He's blocking that zone of control. So enemy zone of control is not affecting this. They are negating it. But this guy, what's going on with him? All right, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, not good enough, right? There's no HQ around in this situation. And he only made it to here. Right, and these are not detrainable hexes. The enemy axis unit is cutting off the railway line. So he is still out of supply. So let's see, let's take a look at our options now that we're back in the supply phase, right? Just giving you an idea of all the different possible things that can happen. Well, now he can eat off the map. Remember, it's one token, feeds two regimental equivalents. That's the minimum payment. So I can just take this allied supply here and I can reduce it by one. Right? And now he's fed. He's good. He doesn't have to go through that evil out of supply situation and roll on the supply table and risk death, which none of us like to deal with. He's okay. He's fed for one token. Right? That's another example of what can happen. Now let's just finish reading. Here we go. Specialty supply levels. Uh, Non-combat units never require trace supply or fuel. HQs never need supply, just like any other combat unit. And... Uh, yeah, HQs, they do need supply, like any other combat unit. Non-combat units never require trace supply or fuel. Air bases need on-map supply to refit aircraft. Other than that, they don't require supply, and ships do not require supply. So just a few asterisks at the very end there to give people an idea of uh, what they might be dealing with. Now, there's a few more things that I would like to demonstrate here in this Tunisia demonstration. Um, I'm going to be using Smolensk to explain extenders and to explain transport points, but I'm going to use this Tunisia demonstration to explain what happens with internal stocks and what happens with um, supply capture. Starting with supply capture, right? Let's say that the Allied turn is over and we're back in the Axis turn. And let's say that the Axis doesn't move anything, we're going to go straight into the combat phase for the Axis, right? which occurs after supply, after enemy reaction. Let's say the enemy didn't react. We're in combat, and let's just say for the sake of argument that there was a combat between this unit and that unit, and this American unit died. I'm not going to get into the details of how that works, but let's just say that this American unit is dead, and this Axis unit chooses to advance. And now we have an Axis unit in the same hex as Allied Supply. What happens? Well, for that, we refer to 12.11, destruction and capture, right? Blowing dumps. Now, this isn't particularly relevant to exactly what's happening here, but I'm going to read it anyway. All supply points in a hex, both those loaded on transport points and those on the ground, can be blown if a player fears they may be captured by the enemy. Unfortunately, the allied player didn't do that this time. A combat unit need not be present in the hex. This can only be done during the movement segments of his movement, reaction, and exploitation phases. A player can blow a given dump up only once per phase and can attempt to blow it up all or some in the supply of the supply point in a dump. Roll one die on the dump blowing table to determine the percentage of supply points destroyed. Round losses to the nearest token. Now, what does that look like? That looks like this one right here. Right? You roll a dice and that determines how much of the dump is blown up. Right? However, the allied player didn't do it. The supply is intact. Right, so what happens next? Capturing dumps. When an attack capable unit enters a hex with an enemy supply point and transport points, roll on the appropriate column of the capture table. Enemy combat units in the hex must, of course, be evicted before an attempt can be made. See 9.14b and 14c for complete details. Yeah, so 9.14 details specialized combats, which we're going to get to in a second, but I just want to note that it has to be an attack capable unit. Right? Non-attack capable units simply can't enter hexes like this. They can't. They can't capture airbases. They can't capture dumps. They can't 
advance after combat because they're not capable of attacking. So just keep that in mind. So let's go to 914B and say, scrolling all the way up, 9.14, as I mentioned, covers specialized combats. Supply dumps. When an enemy attack capable unit enters a hex with a supply dump, consult the capture table to determine how much supply points are captured by the enemy player. The rest are destroyed. All right. Now, transport points have a bit of a different capture system that I'm not going to get into right this second, but I will demonstrate it in Smolensk in a moment. So we've just entered a hex with allied supply in it. We need to immediately resolve this. We're going to go to the capture table. All right. There's a dump on the ground. Right, you roll one dice. Let's just roll one dice, shall we? Three. Three is 25%. Number of percent is captured, the rest is handled below. Remainder is destroyed. Um, so, in the case of one, right, just keep in mind with these rules, they apply one and two and four, and one, three, and four, right? So, in this case, only one applies, the remainder is destroyed, right? And just like we read in the rule, Right, round to the nearest token. So 25% of three tokens, right? Let's, so if we say three tokens, three divided by four, 0 0.75, right? So you round that up to one token. So the player gets one token, right? Press control V, reduce it, press control V, the axis is captured one token, right? Simple as that. That's supply capture. All right, let's get back down to the supply section. All right, so we've covered supply capture. And uh, there's only one more thing I want to cover in this. Um, and that is low stocks, All right? Let's say for the sake of argument that in this same combat phase, the Axis had a combat unit here that had moved up, right? And now that the Axis has captured this supply dump, this Axis unit in the same combat phase is going to attack this unit. It is supplied one way or the other, and uh, this allied unit dies, and the Axis unit advances. Oh, actually, no, hold on. I'm going a bit too quickly here. Right. The Axis unit initiates combat, and its combat supply is paid for by the Axis. However, as you can see here, the uh, Axis has already captured the supply dump that the Allies were planning to use. So what happens now? Let's talk about that. Internal stocks. Internal stocks represent the ammo supplies the unit can draw upon when supply points are unavailable. They can only be used for combat supply, see 9.5b. Never for barrages, trace supply, fuel, etc. A unit's combat strength is the same whether using internal stocks or on map supply. Show usage of internal stocks individually, placing low or exhausted markers under each unit. Internal stocks can be used only when a unit can't obtain via direct draw or HQ throw needed supply points from on-map stocks. So you can't optionally use it. It's only when on-map supply is not available, like a situation like this, right? There is an exception to that, though. Internal stocks can be used if the only available supply dump is supply points loaded on organic trucks. So there is situations that that does apply to, right? When a unit gets combat supply from its internal stocks, mark it low. If the unit is already marked low, flip the marker to exhausted, which means that after this combat, its internal stocks are empty, right? A unit that is marked low or exhausted is still eligible to use, uh, is still eligible to use regular combat supply. If regular combat supply is not available, a unit with exhausted marker cannot attack at all and must defend without combat supply at half strength per 9.5a, right? That's part of the combat supply mechanics, you know, the, defending without combat supply puts you at half strength, right? But low stocks and, you know, and the flipping it over to exhausted is a form of combat supply. No unit can ever draw on another unit's internal stocks even when stacked together. So this is just individual to each unique unit, right? Recovery. Now we're going to get into that in a moment. Let's just see the consequences of this, right? So let's say there's a combat here and he attacks... Uh, however, the allied unit does not have combat supply, so we're going to go and we're gonna give him low stocks, right? That goes underneath the unit, as dictated before. And let's just say, for the sake of argument, that uh, the allied unit is forced to uh, retreat and to avoid uh, retreating into an enemy zone of control, the consequences of which will be described in the combat video. He's going to retreat here, right? And 
uh, the enemy will advance, right? And so he's retreated in combat and he's got a low stocks marker, right? Now let's talk about what happens with this low stocks marker. Units marks low or exhausted have to recover internal stocks in the player supply phase if supply points are available via direct draw or throwing via HQ. Recovery costs two tokens per unit or per regimental equivalent if it's a multi-step unit. Recovery from exhausted costs twice that amount. So an exhausted, if this guy was exhausted, for example, if we flip that over because he used low stocks again, that would cost one supply point, right? Now, a few notes. Units must recover internals if possible. This recovery takes priority over using supply points as a substitute for trace supply, right? So this, this stuff can really hoover up your supply in a bad situation if you're not lucky or if, you, if you've planned things out poorly. All supply dumps from which a unit can draw from over three thrown supply points are subject to the required recovery of internals, right? And there is only an exception to this, and that is that uh, supply points and organic trucks do not have to be used to uh, uh, restore internals. So organic trucks have that little special thing going for them. Keep that in mind. So in the allied turn, if there was, for example, a supply dump up here, uh, in the supply phase, if this unit hasn't done anything else or used fuel or if this supply dump hasn't been used, then that 2T would have to be deleted in order to delete that low stocks, right? And you will see many more examples of that over the course of many other examples of play. There is a C here. If some supply points are available but not enough to fully recover internals, expend whatever supply is available. A single token would be wasted. 2T would recover low to ex ex uh, one low unit or improve an exhausted to low. So keep in mind, it is pretty expensive and prohibitive. Right? So just keep that in mind whenever you end up in a low stock situation. Out of supply status does not affect internal stocks or vice versa. Keep that in mind as well. Internal stocks and supply points can be mixed together to pay for combat supply. Exception, a single counter, even one with multiple steps, such as division, can either use internal stocks or on map supply. Such a unit cannot mix the two for itself. If a multi step unit chooses to use internal stocks because there is not enough on map supply available, the on map supply will still be spent. It is wasted. So don't try, try not to get yourself into situations like this. They are very expensive. I've been there. It sucks. There is an example here if you need to read it. All right, so that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to cover supply-wise on the Tunisia board, but I want to swap over now to Smolensk to give you an idea of how extenders work and how rail repair units work and what happens when a transport unit is captured or when an extender is overrun just there's this isn't a proper real game this is i've set this up for demonstration purposes only because these are very specific concepts that require specific explanations so let's start with extenders all right extenders are used to help bridge gaps in trace supply five transport points of the same type usually truck or wagon in a hex can be converted into an appropriate extender counter by expending half of their movement allowance. Extenders cannot move or be used for any other transport point purpose. Organic trucks can never be used to create an extender. If a game's counter mix does not include extenders, always on the back of a five point transport point, they cannot be used at all. Right? So keep in mind, Tunisia 2 does not have extenders. That's why I'm using Smolensk to uh, explain this. Right. The only purpose of extenders is to create new locations from which trace supply can be drawn. They never move supply points, they don't move railroad cargo, and they don't increase throw or draw ranges. Extenders can act as trace supply source when it is linked to a detrainable hex directly to a supply source. It can be a connection between two sets of rail hexes, allowing hexes along the forward line to become detrainable if the back one leads to a supply source. Right. Or a connection between a rail hex and a supply source, making hexes along the rail line detrainable. Right? Bear in mind again that does not count for rail transport, just for trace supply. 
right? So, extenders have a range that is the maximum distance in movement points back to the connected hex. The extender is always posted at the forward end of the connection, the hex furthest away from the ultimate supply source. So basically speaking, it's a draw range. It's not a throw range. Always draw from an extender when you're tracing these pathways. An extender can link to other extenders in a daisy chain to make longer connections. Keep that in mind. This stuff can get pretty in-depth. Creating extenders. Switching into an extender costs a transport point half of its movement allowance. Extenders cannot move unless they flip back to the transport point side of the counter using half of their movement allowance to do so. So again, using half the movement allowance to become one, using half of the movement allowance to unbecome one, so to speak. All right. Um, using half of their movement allowance to do so, yes. A given extender may be formed only by one type of transport point, truck or wagon, not both. One moment. An extender cannot be created in a hex where it cannot connect to a trace supply source at that moment. Extenders that later have their trace cut can stay as extenders, though they cease to function as such. Right, so transport points moving into an extender can come from different hexes combining into a common hex where each spends half of its movement allowance. So they can all combine together so long as they're all spending less than their half of their movement allowance, right? After an extender switch back into transport points, the points can then be moved into separate different hexes. They do not need to move as a stack. Right now there is a big diagram here explaining, explaining extenders, but I will generally use my own game here to explain it, right? Extenders can apply the adjacent is good enough rule as in all other supply related functions. Extenders collapse when enemy combat units into the hex and can also do so voluntarily, right? And they, there's a plane on here to garrison extenders or else. Right, so pretty short, actually, or, or, or for what it is. But what it is, it, it's, it's, a tra it's a trace supply function, and I'm going to explain exactly how it works using Smolensk. So now I do need to explain a few other things. In Smolensk, for example, and in most Eastern Front games, there is a concept of railway gauge, right? Now, I'm going to explain this a little bit more in a few minutes when we talk about railway conversion, but for the sake of what we're talking about now in trace supply, just keep in mind that you can only get trace supply from detrainable hexes on your gauge of trace supply. And in the case of the Germans in this demonstration game, I'm showing these railhead markers show the extent of their gauge. So for now, Mogilev this city Mogilev is the extent of their trace supply, right? Let's just say for the sake of this demonstration, German trace supply only extends up to Mogilev, right? But I've got German units all the way here at Yatsevo, a good couple of hundred miles away, right? A well, hundred or so miles away, whatever. How is that possible? How How is he getting trace supply all the way from Mogilev? I have to zoom out quite a bit here, I'm sorry, but it's just necessary because we're dealing with some very long distances, right? How does this German combat unit all the way here at uh, Yatsevo get its trace supply from Mogilev? I'll explain how. There's something here in Smolensk called an extender, right? Now, most truck extenders that you deal with are going to have a 20 truck movement point range, right? So what, it, what what's happening here is that this infantry unit at Yatsevo is using its draw range to go one, two, three, four. And that's its trace supply situation settled because that extender is a trace supply source. It is a trace supply source. Why is it a trace supply source? Well, we have A here. It is a source when it is linked to a detrainable hex or directly to a supply source. Is this extender linked to a detrainable hex? Well, can we get to Mogilev and 20 truck movement points? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. We didn't even have to go adjacent. There you go. It's uninterrupted by enemy units and zone of control. It goes all the way back to Mogilev, which is currently a trace supply source. And there you go. It is now a trace supply source in and of itself. Right? But I have a few other extenders around the map to show you some examples of how this works mechanically. But that is the most basic example I can show of uh, a truck, a unit using a truck extender as a trace supply source. In games on the Eastern Front, especially Smolensk and Gadarian's Blitzkrieg and Case Blue and a combination of the two, extenders will be critical. Why? Well, 
because of railroad repair. It's slow as hell. And let's get into that now. Let's talk about railroad repair um, because it's basically goes in tandem with extenders, right? So to look at this, we need to go to back to 3.3 railroads. Now, much of this we read in the previous episode talking about unit movement. But for this section, we will read the parts that we didn't read before called railheads, this section here, and rail conversion and railroad repair units, right? So let's start with railheads. Some games limit each size railroad usage to certain gauge or width of track, right? Show a divide, show a divide between gauges on the map with railhead markers, which as you can see, I'm using here, right? As one example, right? Or over here as another example, right? These markers are only removed by the conversion work of rail repair units. Hello, there's our rail repair unit here to give us a demonstration. All right. Other ground units moving through rail hexes have no effect on the position of a railhead. Some games only have one gauge of railroad track, such as Tunisia 2. In these, players can use railhead markers to show the forward extent of rail hexes under their control. Not really necessary, but you can. Right. So, now, rail movement, we're not going to talk about. We went over that in the previous episode. But we are going to talk about rail conversion. In games with more than one rail gauge, a side can only use its rail capacity or supply line trace along rail lines of a particular gauge. Eligible rail repair units are used to convert railway lines to the gauge appropriate to their side. Right? Players keep track of the current extent of each rail gauge using railhead markers. Railroads cannot be converted in an enemy zone of control, and a railroad repair unit can, can convert a hex simply by moving into it. Conversion does not cost supply points or extra moving points. Railroad repair units. Rail repair units are combat units that are used to convert railroad hexes. Several special rules govern them. A rail repair unit can combine rail movement with conversion in the movement phase. Exception, they cannot do so if the hex is being used for rail movement or convert in the current phrase, no leapfrogging. Keep that in mind. I'm not going to be demonstrating that now. He's just starting at the railhead. Rail repair units can move their full movement allowance after using rail movement, less any movement done prior to in training, and can use rail movement in combat mode. So they're pretty versatile on the railways, just these units only. Rail repair units can entrain and detrain in any railroad hex. It need not be detrainable. All right. Again, another helpful thing about them. They're pretty weak. They're not relevant in combat, but they just have all these special functions to help them in their railroad repairing duties. Rail repair units can convert up to four hexes or hexes equal up to their current MA if it's less than four during the movement phase, not other phases. So this might have a movement allowance of five, but it can only convert four. All right during the movement phase. They must be in combat mode or in DG mode and oriented towards combat mode, right? Uh, and we've already covered railhead control in a previous video. So let's keep it simple. Let's just do it with this guy. Let's just go one, two, three, four. And we've just extended the railhead to Chelsea now. Why have I done that? Because I want to use it as a way to show you another example of how extenders can work. Now, I have this extender over here. I want to capture Roslavl, right? And I want to use this unit to capture Roslavl. But before Chelsea was captured, this unit was getting its trace supply being thrown from this HQ. This HQ was drawing to Mogilev, right? Meaning this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 adjacent. Right, so this unit was really at the very edge of its trace supply net. It couldn't reach Roslava without going out of supply. But now that we've converted the railway line up to Chelsea, we've got this extender here. Hello, conveniently. Right, this extender goes. It's it's a it's a leg movement point wagon extender. Keep that in mind. It's not the same as a truck movement point extender. Right, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten adjacent. And it makes it adjacent to Chelsea, which is now converted into the German railway gauge. So it does get trace supply. So it is now a trace supply source for our infantry division friend over here. So we can happily march 
right into Roslavl, capture it, and still remain in trace supply thanks to his friend, the extender here. That's just another example of how extenders work. But I want to give you yet another example. Now that I have an extender here, I'm going to daisy chain it. Because hello, I have another stack of five wagons, right? Remember, you need five of these to turn into an extender, right? Up here at Pochenok. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to spend half of their movement allowance to turn them sorry, into an extender. Now that extender can extend to this extender, which in turn extends back to Chelsea, which is a trace supply point, which means that, uh, oh, hold on, it doesn't need to do it there. He can do it a little bit further back. So let's trace, right? So one, because it's tracing 10, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right, so he can actually go into Smolensk itself and then become an extender, replacing the truck extender, providing the exact same purpose, but now it, it daisy chains from here to here to here. All right. I know this can seem a little bit convoluted. Extenders are a bit difficult to wrap your head around. But I will I will use the extender diagram to explain this a little bit more in depth if I can find it. Right. See here in this diagram, which you can see in your manual, extenders can be daisy chained. This white box represents a unit. This HQ represents a HQ throwing to the unit and drawing to an extender. That extender draws to another extender, and that extender draws to a trace supply source. Alright? Perfectly legal. And now just as an example to show you what else you can do moving from this, this extender can turn back into trucks using half of its movement allowance. It now has 22.5 movement points left, right? And it could go 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, and it could pick up these five supply points for, and then become, then that costs five movement points. I'll explain why in a moment. Right, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, right? I just did some truck stuff with that unit after turning it back into trucking units after it was an extender, right? It, let's just say for the sake of argument, it started this phase as an extender, right? But since I've replaced its extender duties with this wagon extender, which is daisy chaining back to this extender, which in turn is extending back to this detrainable hex, which is in turn extending back to this map edge hex, which is where the trace supply is originally coming from via the railway, we have ourselves a fragile but intact trace supply network going all the way up to Yardsevo for this unit to stay in trace supply. But I just moved that truck around, I picked up some supply. So let's end this video by talking about transport points and how they actually work right because there is a bit of a set of rules here right governing transport points um, so let's finish with this transport points move supply points across the map specialized combats involving these are covered in 9.14c so let's create a threat so that we can uh, capture it after i've done explaining this and finish the video with a supply point capture right so Sequencing and transport. A transport can move, pause to use some of its load, and then continue moving. This is the only uh, exception to the whole chess related once you move a unit, you have to stop moving it rule, right? While pausing, the carried supply points can be used to pay for all kinds of fueling and construction or repair. There are two important restrictions. The transport point must finish before another unit is moved and upcoming combat and barrage costs can never be prepaid in this fashion. So what this essentially translates to is what we like to call drive-by fueling, right? A unit could stop, fuel a bunch of units and keep moving. That is the only thing that this really is used for, for the most part. Supply points need not be unloaded for a transport point before being used, right? Transport points never need fuel and are never out of supply. Keep that in mind, right? They are basically self-sufficient. Mechanical handling. Transport points can carry up to their size in supply points. Transport points can combine and divide within counter mix limits. Dividing or combining does not cause does not cost movement points. It can be done in any friendly movement phase and only if all of the involved transport points are in the same hex. 
The combined divided transport points can continue to move but must conform to the limitations of 6.1F. But see 12.7E and 12.7F for some liberties given to extenders, right? Um, and I do, I will explain what happens to extenders when enemy units come into their hex, they collapse. Different types of transport points can never be combined into a single counter, and these restrictions include organic trucks, which cannot combine with or divide into regular trucks. Exception, unit consolidation can be used to convert a regular truck into an organic truck. Keep that in mind. Consolidation is something that really kind of needs its own video, because there's it's just such a niche thing that has only a few applications at certain times. Mode restrictions. Transport points are never in move mode. Uh, they are in move mode at all times. They are never in combat strat, reserve, DG, or exploit. It, there's only one exception to this. Organic trucks can enter reserve mode along with the rest of their division. A transport point can be shipped by sea or by rail, but not by air. There is an exception. Mules found in some games can be shipped via air transport. Right. The shipping cost is always equal to the size of the transport point, which can be transported while lo with load while loaded supply with while loaded with supply points for the same shipping cost there right loading and unloading place loaded supply points under transport points if you're playing on the board but if you're playing on vassal you can just use the uh, control f function right and place unloaded supply points above any transport points in the stack a transport point cannot be loaded via direct draw or via thrown supply points it must be in the same hex as a dump Note supply points can in effect be unloaded by direct draw and its load is used by nearby units and HQs. Loading requirements, they have to be in the same hex. Unloading requirements, a transport point can unload in a hex which contains a friendly combat unit, port, airbase, or existing unloaded supply dump. Keep this in mind. Um, it's an easy rule to break because you just think you can dump supply anywhere, but unfortunately you can't. A transport point can only unload in a hex which contains a friendly combat unit, port, airbase, or an existing unloaded supply dump. So you can't just dump supply in the middle of nowhere where there's nothing, right? Easy rule to break, believe me. Um, costs. Transport point pays 10% of its printed movement allowance to load or unload any number of supply points in a hex. Round the cost normally, right? So to the nearest, to the nearest point. So a truck with 45 MA must pay five movement points to unload or load supply points. So let's just undo a bunch of those moves so I can show you exactly what happened there again, right? So before I do that, let's just quickly talk about organic trucks. A multi-unit formation sometimes is given special attached transport points and organic truck is handled like other transport points with several exceptions. Organic trucks can never unload supply points on the map. They allow units of the same multi-unit formation to draw the supply points. They can never create extenders. They can go into reserve mode. If they get a DG result, that has to be removed, but they do not go into DG per se, right? They can tag along with other retreating combat units in a stack, but they can't retreat alone, right? They convert, when ca they convert into regular transport points when captured, and they can withhold combat supply as per what we were reading in regards to uh, uh, low stocks and such with uh, multi-unit formations. Players can use HQs to throw supply from organic trucks to units of that formation, right? So it can't be used to throw to other units. So any supply points on an organic truck is basically locked there. Uh, full notation. Some games have transfer points with an F on the yellow box on one side and no such notation on the back. The F donates that the, tra the transport point is full, while the other side shows that it is empty. Use the empty side to plus some tokens for a partially loaded transport point, right? You can do that. It's, yeah, it's, there's a few different ways to cook that egg, right? Transport points that are captured in the movement phase can move immediately. If captured in any other phase, no movement is allowed until the capturing side's next movement phase. Just keep that in mind, right? Now, just as a quick demonstration of exactly what we just read, right? This extender will turned back into five truck movement points using half of its movement allowance and it'll go so let's just say that it's got 22 movement points now that it's halved one two three four five six seven eight it costs five of its printed movement allowance because ten percent to pick this up right five so ten becomes fifteen all right 
16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Well, 22, all right? 22.5 if we were to be exact. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, never mind, I miscalculated. So it's eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, plus five for the loading, of course, 20, 21. Yeah, so basically you can get back here, sorry. Obviously doing things a bit willy-nilly, but uh, you get the idea, right? Try practicing moving some transport points around on your own board. You'll see exactly how this stuff works out. Now, capture, let's just um, take an extender and take a truck point and capture them with enemy units, and I'll explain to you exactly how this works, right? It is usually detailed under 9.14 specialized combats, right? So let's start with transport points. When an enemy attack capable unit into the hex of transport points, they might capture some of the transport points in the rest of this place. Roll on the trucks column of the capture table, check the combined transport with an MA of more than 10, and then roll on the wagons for anything with an MA with five or less. Right, so let's, um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll just use these two examples. Um, results are explained on the table and affect transport and any loaded supply points equally. Uh, when there is a mixture of supply points and tr uh, when there is a mixture of transport points, such as regular trucks and organic trucks and wagons and mules, the owning player decides which is captured and which is uh, displaced. Right? Enemy units, zone of control, and prohibited terrain do not affect displacement. Just pick up the transport point and place them in their new location. A captured transport point can move immediately if captured in the movement phase, but not captured in other phases, just like we read. A transport point captures are usually rounded to the nearest full point, only round to token size trucks if the game counter mix includes them. Supply points is always rounded to the nearest token. So that's a, yeah, it's handled in a very weird way in Tunisia too, because they do have token trucks. Just read the game specific rules for how that actually works, right? Important note, an extender can never suffer a loss on the capture table, nor does it figure into the total number of trucks or wagons present in a hex when calculating the percentage lost. Instead, they collapse per 9.14d, which we'll cover. So let's just start with uh, capturing trucks, right? This enemy unit has entered the hex of the trucks. Let's go to the capture table, right? And we roll one dice here on the trucks, including loaded supply points. Bang. One. Zero. Oh. Well, in that case, that truck would be totally dead and go to the uh, German dead pile, right? Let's try a different roll to give a better example of how this works. Two. Also zero. Let's roll again. Five. Okay, that's better. 50%, right? So 50% is captured, rounded to the nearest truck point. So 52.5, that rounds up to three, right? So what we would do is we would go get a Russian truck. So we get three Russian trucks, right? And that includes the supply points on the... Uh, on them, so they're just full, right? And these guys go to the dead pile. So, German dead pile, away they go. And then the new unit for the Soviets is placed on the map. And um, now the remainder, sorry, I should say, right? So three German trucks, it's important to differentiate. Three German trucks are put in the dead pile right two remaining trucks are displaced per this section here two roll two up to 10 hexes so as the german player i can just go right one two three four five six seven eight nine ten right i can displace them here and get them out of harm's way and this many trucks are captured and that's how that works all right Let's finish this off by looking at how extender collapse works so that we can say that we've completely covered this part of the manual for you, my friend, right? Extender collapse. When an enemy attack unit enters a hex with an extender, this extender must collapse. This same procedure is available at the player's option as an alternative to its regular movement, useful when extenders have lost trace supply. So just keep this in mind. Everything that I'm about to show you is also voluntary. You can extend collapses yourself. You can extend 
Jeez, what a faux pas right there. You can collapse extenders yourself if you wish. Displace a collapsed extender to any hex within its special draw range that is currently in trace supply. Enemy units, ZOCs, and prohibited terrain have no effect on displacement, and no loss or capture is possible. Flip the extender to its regular transport side in the new hex. So watch this. All right. All right. So this guy enters the enemy hex. What happens now? All right. Any hex within a special draw range, which is ten leg movement points. All right. Enemy units, ZOCs, prohibited terrain. They have no effect on displacement, and no loss on capture is possible. Flip the extender to its regular transport side in the new hex. All right. If no legal hex exists, capture is not possible. Instead, flip the extender back and have it check for capture, right? So it just needs to go somewhere within trace supply. And that's, you know, say for the sake of argument, that might be so within its special draw range that is currently in trace supply. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Seven and you know this this is currently in trace supply because this extender is still valid, so it it, it basically collapses over here within its special draw range, and it turns back into five wagon points. Right, this technically makes them invincible so long as they have somewhere to collapse to that's within trace supply. That is the design, you know, th because remember extenders are a special unit; they are not technically in the hex that you have placed them in. They are in constant motion, so it is kind of pos impossible, theoretically, to capture them, so to speak. Unless they are really, really behind, you know, like their line. It, unless they are providing trace supply very... Yeah, it, it's, it's situational, you know, but for starters, try not to get them get captured in the first place, generally speaking. Anyhow... That's just a brief demonstration of how extended collapse works. And with that being done, I believe uh, that is a basic demonstration of supply, you know, combat supply, fuel supply, uh, trace supply. There will be further demonstrations of how these things work in later videos, you know, as a part of other explanations. Um, but yeah, this is just, you know, we've just gone through the manual, we've taken a look at the supply in all the different contexts and how transport points work, how extenders work, how rebuilding the rail network for your side works, just all those things have now been covered in this video. So thanks for joining me and I look forward to you joining me for the next video. Thank you.